Hi, I'm Shashi Kiran with AppSero and I'm here with Wipin Jain from Cisco and we're going to talk a little bit about containers and microservices. Uh, now, Wipin is a guy whom I've known for almost 15 years and uh, he's always doing something that's very interesting, insightful, impactful and um, you know there's a lot to learn from, from Wipin. So Wipin, thanks for joining. Um, thanks, what Sasha. are you doing at Cisco? What mischief are you up to now? Well, you know, I think containers are very exciting uh, these days and uh, to me it is bringing standardization of application formatting and delivery, which changes everything how applications get developed, delivered and, and rolled out. So I'm trying to see how can we take that to production and to take it to production, I'm trying to lead a project, uh, an open source project called Contive, uh, where we are trying to define the operational policies that can be used to govern how exactly and what behavior those container workload needs in a runtime environment uh, for microservices or for DevOps environment. That's what I'm working on. So project Contive, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into this. Sure. Um, what sparked this idea for you? Right. And what are some of the use cases you're trying to address with it? Correct, correct. So, I mean, so what I started off like putting lots of containers and I see I try to see how much I can pack, you know. So I tried to put like thousand containers on a host, and then I started realizing that there was contention. And the main idea behind microservices is that use all the resources as you have available, but but when you have contention, try to make sure that you have the right prioritization, right security put in place and uh, various policies that govern that. So out of that came like, you know, why not we create some kind of platform to be able to achieve this uh, framework which can then be used to say that, you know, I have these applications, these are production applications, keep them isolated from my test applications. Similarly, these test applications are okay if they talk to each other no matter how, but in production application, I want to restrict who talks to who and who, who's the user who can, you know, spin up certain containers versus not. And so to be able to govern that thing, to be able to specify what policies are needed for security, for, for prioritization, and to actually operationalize the microservices architecture. That's when I started you know, uh, writing uh, and, and learning some Go language and started playing with it. So I know from your background, you were uh, an ASIC engineer, you were into a lot of hardware, and then right. you started going down the path of becoming a lot more software focused. Yeah. And I know Contev isn't necessarily just software, but it's also something that Cisco is doing in the open source community. Correct. So uh, could you just talk us through how is this open source uh, effort working out? It's not a Cisco product. Mm -hmm. How do you get the community involvement going? Right, right. So I mean, it's a great question. You know, um, So open sourcing something versus enabling community are really two different things. When you open source something, you're, you're, you're basically saying that here's my code, go take a look at it, play with it, hack around it, and contribute back. But in my opinion, it's more than that. What we are doing really is, you know, we break up our components into small libraries and small utilities and small packages. And what we do is we open source every single of those components, which means that if someone likes uh, one of our test libraries or someone likes our you know, uh, you know, open flow pipeline or if someone likes our networking versus storage or policy part of it, it's not like take it all or leave it. What we are approaching in open source is truly trying to say is that you know, we, um, we let people use whatever components that they feel, are, they feel they're comfortable using in their own code and that probably will hopefully you know, convince that you know, this is this is one piece that they like and they can build upon their own, uh, you know, their own code on top of it or they could, you know, just leave it there and, and take it the whole, uh, you know, let's say networking or storage or everything together. So, I mean, Cisco is well poised to lead that. Remember I talked about defining infrastructure policies and Cisco being an infrastructure vendor, it makes a lot of sense to lead that uh, and, and come out and say that here are the challenges, here how, here is how we are solving it. and take it from there and, and take that leadership, yes. So full disclaimer, I, I'm a Cisco alumni myself, and uh, so I know a lot of uh, what's been going on in there. Particularly excited about this effort. Uh, coming back to Contev, who would be the contributor to the Contev project, and who mm -hmm. would be a consumer of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, any op ops person technically is a consumer of Contev uh, you know, software. Um, the contributors wise, I would say that you know, bring in your use cases. If it doesn't solve a use case that you have in mind, then let, let's collaborate on that. Uh, so 
I would say that you know anyone who is trying to let's say take that software and companies that have you know a lot of uh, larger teams who are, who have you know resources to be invested into building and writing and tuning some of the code are perfect candidates for contributing into it, um, as well as uh, people who are trying to even build their products out of it. So this is with Apache license; you can take it and, and you know productize it and sell it. That's not a big deal. We we hope that we can learn from each other in this process, and and that's the that's the idea. So I like the fact that you talked about the infrastructure guys maybe contributing, the ops guys consuming as well. Right. And this whole uh, world of DevOps is coming about. I know right. you have a demo here ready right, to right, go. Right. And so maybe you uh, give a bit of context behind the demo. Right. I'd really like to see what is it that you're doing to make uh, the life of a DevOps person much easier. Makes sense. Uh, let's do that, Shashi. Um, you know, what I, you know, in this demonstration, I want to talk about is that uh, for anything to be really DevOps ready, you cannot say you are ready if there is any manual steps involved. In fact, microservices and, and moving to containers is, or DevOps model is primarily embracing uh, what I call completely automated infrastructure right. and tooling, right? So this means that you know, on one hand, you have someone who's trying to apply these rules and restriction governance. That sounds like counter you know, automation to me in, if you just think about it you know, just out of, out, out of the bat. The thing that you know I believe which is possible is that you know try to automate this thing in a way where the right information comes from the right you know person. For example, if an as an application developer, if I'm defining what ports and what kind of uh, uh, you know microservice that I'm exposing myself on, then it's possible to start leveraging that information to create the policies around those things. So what I want to demonstrate really quickly is that you know. How can it be as simple as you know bringing you know I have two uh, you know two schedulers that I integrate with you know of course Docker and, and Kubernetes uh, and in Docker uh, you know integration I want to demonstrate that you know you have Docker composition which specifies all application tiers you could technically take that composition and launch you know and run that composition in your you know swarm cluster for example and and get the policies derived out of the containers which is created by an application developer, which means that a developer creates those containers. At that point, it specifies what ports, like for example, it is trying to uh, you know, expose these policies and all that. But let, let's take a look at it you know, very quickly. Um, so if I were to look at my Docker composition, you know, it's a very simple application. It's a web tier and database tier, which I'm using Redis. Of course, these are my own images because I tried to export some more ports into it to be able to demonstrate the policy. I don't know whether we'll have time to do that, but it's basically saying the web is exposing itself on port 5000 and you know and there is and it is linking to database. So what if we were to launch this application using docker compose for example um, I'll, let's say that you know, I'm launching this in a in, in a production environment. So I call this as a production project and then you know this is Cognitive Compose. It's not exactly Docker Compose because I modified that to instantiate and automate the policies part. So this is not Docker Compose. It's a modified version of Docker Compose. So that's why I don't want to call it Docker Compose. It is, it is what I'm calling Cognitive Compose. So if I bring it up here, uh, then what happens is that, you know, um, I have to, you know, I think uh, there was some setup glitch here. So I'll, I'll restart my setup and, and launch the application composition very quickly. And then what we'll see is that you know some of the policies that are needed uh, could be automatically created um, right from uh, right from the composition when it is trying to come up, and uh, so let, let's see. So I'm going to just create one network and and you know start. Uh, I'll create one network and I'm going to launch all these applications in this network. I'm calling it a private network. And let's go back to our composition uh, you know, demonstration. And so now I'm trying to launch these applications. You see how am I, how, how am I extracting the, the policy information from the image that a developer built. Right. And then I'm instantiating the labels and the policies associated with it. And now I've been able to launch the composition of an application that, that, that you can launch in a cluster of uh, you know, Docker Swarm cluster. And then what you see here is that you know 
in, in a small, very little you know, pane. This was my network. But what you can do is that you, know, you can see that we have started creating groups, and you can scale out this group, and then define, you know, automatically have the policies come under this one. And, and that could say, you know, with what, for example, what ports to allow for this policies and all that. So now if I were to, uh, if I were to go back and, uh, you know, and launch, let's say, the same, you know, uh, same composition against my test, uh, you know, project, then the same thing happens except that, you know, the policies which are created for test environment are not really overlapping with my production environment. So if I were to go, as you see that, you know, uh, we could we could close this one, but if you go back to um, to checking this, you see that there are more policies created, but they are in the test you know for the test environment. Right. And so it allows test uh, web tier to be to be accessing only test database tier, which is very critical because you don't want to accidentally point yourself to uh, to the production web or or production database and you know and and avoid that you know isolation which is needed in this case, right? So you get the segmentation, isolation, and... Um, Correct, yeah. Yeah, the policies are now a lot more automated, right? It is automated, and you know, for this automation to work, there is work involved from the developer as well as from the ops person. So ops person needs to trust that, you know, whatever developer is trying to give the information about, you know, what, what it is trying to encapsulate in an application is tr trusted to a level that, you know, because he's a developer, he knows what ports or what kind of, uh, you know, Requirements are needed from an application, and ops person takes that as a hint and then start deploying these uh, in the ops. So there's better collaboration between the teams, but it also makes their lives easier. Collaboration is automated is the is the key here. Yes, Got there it. is collaboration, but it's not like a human collaboration. It is collaboration by APIs and code. Excellent. So uh, maybe a last question for you. Right. Um, you went through this journey yourself. I would say you're still going through the journey right, of getting right. exposed to containers and microservices. Right. What's uh, what's a good best practice that you would like to, you know, share with somebody else who wants to follow your footsteps here? So I mean, best practices differ if you are if you are looking at it from developer point of view or if you are looking at it from the ops point of view. Let's take one from each. Okay. So if if I am developer, I want to make sure that you know I have the right abstraction for my microservices. They are the APIs are like completely backward compatible, and uh, and I'm writing stateless applications, which can then scale out and, and scale in. I am I'm not depending on some you know consist uh, one database at the back end. I will choose whatever is good for me. Ultimately, what I will want to do is a very highly trust driven um, you know development. Now you know flip over to the ops side of it, which is that you know how do I run them? So first and foremost, I would say that you know make sure you know what's going on. Which means that you know it is important to know what's going on. Then, in fact, running an application, I would say, because uh, with containers, there are like those tiny you know applications which are running in 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 a big giant you know cluster. Let's say you know 100 nodes, and you have probably 10, 20, 50 thousand containers running. You have no idea what's happening. So, knowing what's going on is the most important one. Which means that you have to have the right tooling to be able to get that information out both from the network, storage, compute point of view, who, who authorized to run these applications, what was the chain of sequence in which these things were, were triggered, and who, who, who started that. It's very important even for uh, you know, a, a compliance kind of things and all that. Um, second part to the, to the ops is really trying to, um, uh, trying to be able to have efficient resource utilization. Because as an ops person, that's what you thrive on, trying to get the max out of what, whatever juice is there. And to be able to do that, what you need is that, you know, you could say that go ahead and use all the resources whenever needed, but when there's a contention, you want to have very clearly defined boundaries between now that there's a contention, take out these ones because they are so-called low priority or bad jobs or something that can run in the background later on. But these are like, you know, maybe live processes and all that. So having some kind of control to be able to dictate so that you use your resources to your maximum but yet not lose the control of how you, you know, deploy these applications. Security is a big one, I would say, because you, know, you have to be able to ensure that, you know, uh, like, I, like I was demonstrating, you, that you, know, you, don't, you allow people to give that isolation, not just from a uh, networking point of view, but from storage point of view as well. So I would say that you know, those things uh, constitute roughly some form of uh, you know, uh, things that I would say you know, watch out for. That, that's wonderful. So you're putting yourself in a win-win situation. If this works, the developers love you, the DevOps guys <laughs> love you. Uh, so to end, if somebody wants more information on Project Conte, where would they go? 
I mean, just Google Contiv. <laughs> <laughs> just type in C O N T I V. No, I think you know uh, there is GitHub uh, uh, repository. Uh, uh, Contiv.io has a link to the GitHub page. Um, we welcome people to come contribute to it. Uh, bring their use cases. There are a lot of people who have actually asked their use cases. We gave them the recipes how to enable those things. Uh, or if you want to, you know, hack on it, it's very easily done because we have created uh, a developer guide whatsoever. So in like 30 minutes, you can get going with your own development environment and start making some changes. Uh, it's all coded in Go, so as long as you know Go language, you should be good to go. Excellent. So from an AppSito perspective, we're big on the process of integrating with Contiv as well. It's early days yet, but awesome. it's very promising. So Open, thank you so much for joining right. us and sharing Thanks all the knowledge you. that you managed to accumulate.